idea of the screen. Okay, so, and uh, these differences will be the one of the typical characteristics showing the incompressible fluid characteristics and the compressible fluid one. Okay. Here, let's consider the energy. On the left side, uh, in the cylinder, the mass object, the mass M object is prepared. And beneath it, the water is trying to be filled. And the mass itself is trying to be lifted up. So how large energy is required? As you can easily imagine, the M times the gravitational uh, acceleration G times the height of H would be required to lift up. This would be the potential energy. And to lift up by using the water, almost, uh, no, 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 not almost. The precisely the same value would be required regardless of the loss. Here, the pressure P times A will be the, uh, the, the same force to lift up the mass of the M times gravity G. And times H will be maintained. And this will be replaced by the V. V expresses the volume inside the cylinder. On the other hand, the pressure P can be also replaced by the PS minus PA. PS shows the pressure uh, expressed by the absolute pressure, while PA is the atmosphere pressure. Right. So if you are trying to lift up the same height by using air, how large energy is required? Can you guess? Do you think it requires much energy than the liquid or the same amount of energy? or the less energy is enough. So can you raise your hand among these three choices? So please raise your hand that you think much larger energy is required than the water pressure. Can you raise your hand? You can raise your hand. By, by using the, the mark of the zoom or okay, uh, I, I can't watch it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so do you raise your hand if you think that the same amount of energy is enough? Okay, or the less energy is enough. Mm, it seems that nobody responses. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to give you the answer. Uh, before I uh, consider this phenomenon, uh, let's think about how many parameters are required to consider the condition of the air? This is the state equation suggesting the relationship among the pressure P, volume V, and the temperature T. G suggests the mass of the air inside the cylinder, and R shows the 
uh, the gas constant. If the piston is trying to be pushed by the work of the double C, how large energy is it required? It can be expressed by the following equation, which means the pressure P times the small amount of the change of the volume dV, and this integration will be the work. And then P is replaced by GRT divided by V. And the GRT can be considered as a constant for constant value. Then just you need to consider is the integration of the uh, the uh, inverse of the V. Then as a result, it becomes the minus GRT of times the log of V2 divided by V1. And according to the state equation, you can also obtain the relationship among these value, which means the PA, this is the atmosphere pressure times the initial volume of the V1. And PS is the pressurized, the larger pressure of PS times the compressed volume condition V2. And if this value is replaced by, for example, P as V2 is here and V2, V1 is replaced by PS divided by PA, then you can obtain this WC work expressed by this equation. And this work itself also shows the area of this hatched line. Next, if you are trying to consider the work to extend the load from the initial condition to the value of the V1, then you need to consider the F force times the extension extended length x. And this can be expressed by the PS minus PA times V2. Then uh, the WC suggests this hatched area and VA times V1 suggests this rectangle area a lot. And according to the state equation, this red area equals to this blue area, which means that the PS times V2, PS times V2. And considering that this area is shared, this green area also equals to this blue area. So if you consider this area is shifted to this blue area, then the WC work itself is equal to this hatched area, okay? And this blue area itself is the PS minus PA times V2 is the, just the work which is done by the water. So according to these results, you can say that the whole work done by the pneumatics itself is composed of the, this blue area added by this green area. 
and namely this blue area is called the power transmission energy which is the actual work to be down to the outside on the other hand this green area is called the expansion energy so this energy itself cannot be contributed to the actual work just to be consumed to expand okay so according to these results you can say that pneumatic energy requires much more energy than the liquid energy and actually this is tend to be the loss to be expanded but you can also say that this green part of the energy plays a role to expand the volume itself please look at the next video here two cylinders are connected and these are filled with water if you push one of the cylinders the other side is extended with the same length and if these two loads are pushed at the same time they are completely locked on the other hand the right side is filled with air you can't say that the same amount of the length can be extended from the pushed one and besides if these tools are pushed at the same time you cannot lock this is the another characteristics showing the difference between two okay as a summary you can say that air pressure has a large high compressibility while it is slightly low power transmission efficiency compared to the liquid pressure and the volume changes if the uh, the outer force is added but if it is released the volume can be extended this is the expansion characteristics okay so uh here uh i'm going to show you the application of the expansion characteristics of the uh, pneumatic energy uh this is the general pneumatic circuit and here the cylinder is uh, driven by the pneumatic energy this is a symbolic mark uh this triangle shows the pneumatic power source and the next one shows a regulator which can automatically control the pressure to for the lower streamline and this mark shows a tank and uh this one shows the valve here the valve is a switching and uh, uh so uh with the same uh the mode the simultaneously uh this or uh, the movement is transmitted to the cylinder extension and this is uh uh, the power source of the uh, pneumatics and it is driven by the AC uh, electric power and it shows the compressor and uh, this part uh, is the, the regulator and the cylinder force itself is expressed by the pressure P inside the cylinder times the cross-sectional area A and then the force 
can be determined. Okay, so by using this as a pneumatic elements, you can uh, design the many variety of the robotics, robots. So I'm going to show you the one of the applications. Uh, this is a video. Uh, and uh, in 1995, the big earthquake uh, hit the Japan. And uh, uh, just after the big earthquake, uh, the many buildings are collapsed. And uh, uh, the rescue parties were trying to search the inside of these collapsed buildings to find out the victims. And uh, every time the big earthquake or occurs, uh, the, you tend to see this kind of the scene. And uh, the problem is that uh, after the big earthquake, the aftershock uh, tends to continue. So while continuing the aftershock, so how to get the information safely and uh, efficiently will be very important task. Uh, this picture shows the earthquake hit on the Taipei area. Uh, 1999, uh, it occurred. And you can see the similar situations. The rescue party stayed outside of the buildings due to the aftershock. And in 2001, uh, the terrorist hit the New York. And at that time, the first rescue robots were introduced at the disaster site. Uh, this is a robot of the chlorotype and which was uh, inserted through the drain. And uh, the many dead bodies were discovered. But unfortunately, uh, the, they can't find out the living victims. So uh, we, we means that there the many Japanese researchers trying to develop the, the improved version of the robots to be preparing for the next big earthquake. The problem is how to so introduce the robot, how to so pass through the robot. Uh, so using the, the very small spaces. And uh, this one is expected to move along the debris. And how to find out the faint voice and the debris. Uh, so in that case, the large traversability is required and the robot needs to be portable and lightweight. So after investi investigating many types, we came to a conclusion that the following type will be the one of the options, which means that the robot is tossed through small spaces move around by the rolling motion, uh, which is a very efficient type. And if it faces to the big obstacles, it can jump and land on smoothly for the next movement. And it is going to, it, it was expected to carry the camera and microphone to get the information. And, uh, this is a robot which we developed. This is a second version. And uh, after it jumping on, uh, it could jump again. 
and uh, this one itself is uh, uh, composed of the pneumatic cylinder and electric motor. And for jumping, this pneumatic uh, cylinder uh, could uh, contribute. And while it moves by the wheels, then the, the cylinder can be kept perpendicular to the moving ground by using the two legs. After it jump on the debris, and it could also jump again. And uh, another uh, the mechanism uh, is that uh, it can be stored to the one direction and it can also support the reaction from the another. So by using this mechanism, it can uh, return to the initial uh, posture by just turning the wheels. As you see, even though it fails on the landing, then it can easily recover. Uh, in this robot, this pneumatic circuit was contained. It is composed of the gas bomb, the regulator to maintain the, uh, uh, the constant pressure. And this is a small tank to stock the large inner flow rate. And this is a switching valve. And this one shows the pneumatic cylinder. So how can you design the robot to keep the large enough jumping height. This is one of the issue. So before so showing the solutions, let me briefly show you the pneumatic characteristics. So uh, for the, uh, the flow stream, there is the the theorem called the Bernoulli's theorem. Uh, it is uh, the one of the uh, conservation energies law. And uh, this is uh, the laws for the fluid version. It is composed of the pressure energy and the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So according to this equation, you can suggest that on the high energy pressure area, uh, the flow rate itself becomes the slow, while on the very narrow area, the pressure becomes low and the uh, flow speed becomes faster. And you can also feel this phenomenon uh, here. Uh, the two pet bottles are prepared, and between two of them, the air is flown, which means that then uh, in the narrow area. Uh, the flow becomes faster while the pressure becomes lower. As a result, due to the atmosphere pressure, these two pet bottles were pushed to touch, to be approached. Okay. And another thing, so referring to this Bernoulli theorem, you can also suggest the how large food uh, velocity can occur. And uh, by using these equations, you can neglect the term of the potential energy, uh, supposing that the height 
is kept constant. Uh, this is a state A, and this is a state two. And by using this equation, the velocity of this area Q2 can be obtained from this equation. And supposing that Q2 itself is large enough than the Q1, you can neglect this term. As a result, the Q2 will be the this term, showing that the fluid velocity itself is proportional to the pressure difference the, of the root term. The root of the pressure differences affects on the velocity of the fluid. And actually, uh, this velocity itself is determined by the area, which means that the flow rate is expressed by the fluid velocity on one stream times the area. But in the case of the orifice, the fluid stream itself is shrunk and the actual area becomes much smaller than the uh, existing hole. And this is called the effective cross-sectional area. And uh, ex this effective cross-sectional area S is expressed by the alpha times the actual area. Alpha is a coefficient of this church. And this is uh, smaller than one. So to neglect this contraction, so one of the methods itself is set the hole much more smoothly or much, more, much longer. But this design itself is very complicated. Therefore, actually, this kind of the, uh, the loss is very difficult to be neglected. And another thing. So using these equations, which shows that Q is a flow rate and S is a cross-sectional area, and this is a pressure differences among the uh, input and output. And if these pipes are connected in series, how large cross-sectional area in total would exist? This is a problem here. And since the flow rate itself is flown at the same amount of value throughout the pipe, then you can obtain this relationship at each pipes. On the other hand, total loss of the pressure delta P would be the sum of the pressure loss at each part. As a result, you can obtain the combined cross-sectional area of the square and inverse itself will be the equal of the inverse square of the each cross-sectional area. So it is slightly different from the electric circuit. Please uh, so replace this term with the admittance. In the case of the admittance of the electric circuit, you can express this one, not the square, but just the inverse. But in the case of the fluid, you need to consider the cross-sectional area just like the square term. So if one of the pipes becomes smaller, then 
whole amount of the cross-sectional area will be decreased, even if the another part can be designed in large enough. Therefore, it is important for you to design the pipes to large enough size. On the other hand, if these pipes are connected in parallel, uh, the total cross-sectional area becomes just the sum of the each cross-sectional area. Okay. So next, please consider how to design the cylinder. So let's consider the process of the jumping. Uh, the whole process of the jumping is composed of the following three steps. One is the cylinder tube is accelerated against the rod. In this case, the momentum is uh, expressed by the pressure P times cross-sectional area A of the integration and gravity M1G times the T1. T1 is, uh, shows uh, uh, the acceleration time and K1 shows the loss of the friction. And it is, uh, uh, so driven uh, by the, the equation of the motion. And next, uh, the cylinder tube collides with the rod. And if the momentum is kept conserved, then the momentum just before collides turns into this momentum just after collision. Third step, the kinetic energy turns into the potential energy. Then by using these three, uh, you can guess the, what kind of the size will be the best to realize high enough jumping. So here, let's assume that the volume of each cylinder will be the same. So in this case, which one can realize the higher jumping? The so one is a cylinder and the other is fat, but short. Uh, the stroke. So uh, the main is that how can you keep the large enough momentum at the first step? This is an important factor. And uh, this graph shows that the uh, the horizontal axis shows the cross-sectional area, while the jumping height is uh, shown and the vertical axis. Supposing that the pressure is kept constant, then the jumping height, which means that the momentum of the main line V1 is affected by the time scale of the T1 because this term can be kept constant. So if the gravity and the friction is kept on the larger, longer term, then the M1V1 will be decreased. So, so by using the calculation, uh, if the cylinder becomes fatter and the thicker, since the T1 becomes shorter, then the jumping height becomes higher. This is a case when the pressure is kept constant, but actually the pressure is not kept constant. So how can you estimate the dynamic pressure change inside the pressure? 
this is the next problem. So if you use the following six equations, you can estimate how large pressure is maintained inside the cylinder while the rod is extended. Okay, the first one is the, uh, the first law of the thermodynamics. It is composed of the dynamic uh, input energy to the cylinder. And this is composed of the change in the internal energy plus the work to the outside by the cylinder. Okay. So next, the second equation shows the internal energy. Internal energy itself is expressed by the specific feet of the constant volume times the mass of the air inside the cylinder G and the temperature inside the cylinder T. Next, third, how large input energy is uh, added to the cylinder? DQ can be expressed by the following two terms. One is the heat energy supplied from the tank, and the other is the heat energy added from the cylinder surface. The first one is the uh, heat transition from the tank to the cylinder. Since uh, the flow velocity itself is very high, you can suggest that the air changes falling to the adiabatic change. So the, there is not enough time uh, for the heat to be transmitted. So you can suppose that it follows to the adiabatic change. In this case, following these two very famous equations, uh, you can con uh, construct the equations between the T1 shows the uh, temperature from the input and the T0 uh, showing the temperature inside the tank will be the this one. The kappa shows the ratio of the specific heat value. And uh, uh, this is uh, a video showing uh, what the adiabatic change is. Uh, inside the PET bottle, alcohol is contained. And uh, if it is pushed and then released, then uh, the temperature changes. Just after it is pushed, the temperature increases. And uh, just after it is released, the temperature so decreases. Then uh, the, it reaches the saturated vapor pressure. As a result, the, the, it becomes the mist. Okay, the fifth equation shows the state, state equation of the cylinder inside the cylinder. And please be careful that if you are trying to use the state equation, the pressure P is always measured based on the absolute pressure. Absolute pressure is different from the gauge pressure. Absolute pressure is uh, measured uh, from the complete vacuum con uh, condition, while the gauge pressure shows the measured from the atmospheric pressure. So the differences between two of them is the atmospheric pressure, 0 0.1 megapascal. Actually, that there, there are many varieties of the pressure unit. So it is 
uh, difficult to remember, but please be careful just uh, following uh, the relationships. 0 0.1 megapascal is almost equal to the one ATM atom. And the next uh, referring information is that the pressure inside the tire wheels is almost 0 0.2 megapascal. So uh, comparing to this pressure value, uh, you can suggest, you can uh, so imagine that how large pressure is applied to your robots. Okay, next one is a flow rate. In the case of the incompressible fluid, just like water or the oil, uh, the, uh, the flow rate follows this tendency, uh, which is the square of the pressure differences. The horizontal axis shows the, uh, uh, the pressure differences of the normalized value. Normalized means that the, it is divided by the power source pressure. And the vertical axis shows the flow rate. So you can easily imagine into this tendency uh, if you look at this equation. This is a case of the liquid uh, flow tendency. So, uh, What's the difference between the incompressible and compressible? This one is the compressible fluid tendency. The vertical or the horizontal axis shows the same amount of the normal value, while the vertical axis shows the mass flow rate. The big difference from the incompressible one is that on the high area, high pressure area, the flow rate is kept constant. And uh, it before it reaches the half of the uh, supply pressure, this condition is maintained. It is called the sound flow. And after the critical pressure ratio uh, is over, then the, it turns to the subsonic flow. It uh, decreases drastically. So the reason why it arises this tendency is that uh, since the case of the air pressure, it doesn't uh, affect the directly from the reaction force. If the pressure, the second room pressure is very low. So uh, the air is easily to be thrown to the downstream side. The slightly large. It is not affected by the pressure inside the second room. Okay. So uh, this flow rate itself is expressed by the sound flow rate and subsonic flow rate. So by using these six equations, uh, you can calculate the dynamic pressure change. And uh, this is a, a pressure just before jumping. As you see, actual the pressure itself uh, is, is decreased if the, uh, the cylinder becomes fatter and fatter. Then as a result, uh, the jumping height, which can maximize uh, itself, can exist like that. And uh, if you design the cylinder in the optimal value, you can maximize the jumping height. And this is a robot uh, which is designed in that way.
And by using the, uh, the sensors, uh, it can automatically sense the obstacles. And then as a result, uh, it can jump in a very good timing. Uh, this is a photoelectric sensors. And after it faces to the obstacles, uh, it can automatically jump. Okay. Uh, next, uh, I'm going to show you the valve control. Uh, anyway, that uh, don't you have to take a break? Uh, how about uh, taking a break for five minutes? Is it okay or don't you have to, you don't have to take a break? Uh, five minutes. Yeah, five minutes. Hi. Hi, Okay, let's take five minutes break now.
Okay. Are you ready? Can we resume the class? Professor Skokosh, okay. I think we are ready. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, can you watch? And uh, just a couple of minutes ago, I sent you the another files. So I'm hoping that you can get them. Okay, so next, uh, I'm going to show you the valve control. And uh, in the case of the jumping robot, uh, there are two the valves. And if you categorize the whole of valves for the pneumatics, uh, you can classify it into the following three is, uh, uh, the roles. One is a directional control valve. The second one is a pressure control valve. And the third is a flow control valve. And uh, if you look at your body, you can also have valves. Uh, these are to control the blood, water, and uh, the food, you name it. For example, in the case of the heart, uh, these are the valves, and uh, which plays a role as a kind of the uh, uh, avoiding the counterflow. So it's a kind of the check valve. And this is the structure of the, uh, the check valve inside of the heart. But uh, to be, uh, so maintain the much a much strong structure is required. And uh, our ancestors designed the many types of the structures, such as uh, spool, puppet, and rotary. So let me briefly uh, so explain these different structures. The first one is a spool valve. It is composed of the spool and the sleeve and the spool slide uh, in the three, uh, spool slides along the sleeve line and uh, it can slide in parallel to the sleeve surface so uh, the big advantage of this valve is that the area of the uh, uh, connected area can be changed the continuously in proportion to the spool displacement. Uh, therefore, the flow rate is easy to be controlled. But the difficulty is that the leakage tends to occur between this searing point. On the other hand, this puppet structure can solve the disadvantage of the spool valve. This puppet moves uh, perpendicular to the sleeve surface. So there is no sliding part. So no searing point is required. Therefore, the leakage is easier to be avoided. But the difficulty is that since the uh, cross-sectional area is opened drastically, then it is difficult to control the flow rate. So actually it is uh, controlled by the on-off motion. The third one is a rotor valve and the structure itself is very similar to the spool valve, but the spool itself is replaced by the rotor. And by rotating this 
rotor, the flow rate can be adjusted. And the advantage is that since the uh, torque can be uh, extended by the lever, then uh, even if the large friction is occurred between two of them, it can be operated. Okay, so the bar used for this jumping is this, uh, this three port valve. Actually, it is uh, the puppet valve. And this is a pressure source, the air pneumatic cylinder part, and the released port. If it is connected to the, uh, this air cylinder is connected to the release mode, then it, it can be exhausted. And if this rod itself is pushed, then this part is connected. As a result, the cylinder can be pressurized from the pressure power source to the cylinder. And this is the structure of the solenoid switching valve. And uh, that part, uh, the former part is placed here. And uh, this rod itself is driven by the coil. And uh, it is uh, widely used for switching the valve. Okay, uh, so please be notice, please be careful to use the cylinder. In the case of the cylinder, there are uh, many types, but if you use the rod, the one port, uh, the half part of the rod type, then the pressure receiving area between two of them is different. Therefore, even though the constant flow rate is supplied, the out motion and in motion becomes the different. Since the pressure receiving area for the out motion is larger than that of the in motion, the load speed becomes slower than the in motion. So how to control the uh, cylinder to be equalized between two of them? So supposing the pressure receiving area for the left side is double of the right side. In this case, if the flow from the right side is connected to the left side, then you can increase the flow rate because the flow from the pump is added by the right side, then the flow rate itself can be increased. On the other hand, in the case of the in motion, only the flow from the pump is supplied. Then the force itself can be equalized and the force at the speed velocity can be also equalized. It is called the differential circuit. And uh, many industrial machines utilizes this kind of the circuits. The next solution is using the valve control. Here, uh, the import and output, uh, the speed controllers is equipped. The speed controller itself is composed of the two elements. One is the throttle valve. Throttle valve means uh, the cross-sectional area is adjusted uh, by the manually. And this is the check valve. Check valve means it allows to flow to this way, but it cannot allow to flow to this way. So uh, the counter flow can be uh, uh, so, uh, 
uh, uh, the counter flow can be protected. So it's a kind of the diode in the electric circuit. If it is pushed out, ah, so this is a pump. Uh, it flows from here to this way, but it doesn't flow to this way. It flows to this uh, throttle uh, valves, and then it goes to this side. And to the outboard, uh, it falls to not only the throt uh, throttle valve, but it also allows to the check valve. Then it returns to the air like this. So as you see, in this case, the input of the air flow can be controlled by the throttle valve. And uh, this is very useful to reduce the energy loss. But once the, uh, the load to the this way works, it cannot be controlled. In this case, the output flow should be controlled. This is a case that then import is not restricted by the valve, but the output is restricted by the throttle valve because to the output, it doesn't flow to this way, it flows to this way. So in this case, uh, the, uh, it is very robust for the outer load. This control method is called the meta out, while the, the left side control is called the meta in. So you can select uh, depending on your application. Uh, this is a structure of the outer view of the speed controller. And uh, the inside of this valve, it contains the check valve and uh, the restriction. Here, it is connected to the uh, pressure power source and it goes through to this way. And here, uh, there is no uh, thrust, uh, throttle valves. But if the pressure is uh, uh, supplied from the cylinder, uh, it cannot go through this way because it works to the check valve. It only allows to flow to this way. And in this case, uh, at here, uh, uh, the flow rate itself is reduced then it is controlled. And as uh, to control the uh, uh, much more precisely, the PWM control, which is the abbreviation of the power switch module uh, control is also utilized. In the case of the, uh, the puppet valve, it is difficult to control the flow rate. But if you adjust the, uh, the term for opening, then uh, you can virtually control the cross-sectional area, which means this is uh, uh, periodically driven with uh, a cycle of the time t. If the opened area time is uh, large, then the flow rate of the average value becomes large. While if the opened time is uh, short, then the average flow rate becomes the very slow. So by adjusting the opening time, you can control the flow rate. This is another type of the control of uh, the valves. And uh, uh, the likely to the, unlikely to the, uh, the switch valve, uh, the open area is uh, controlled in the analog way. And this is called the proportional control valve. 
uh, which is uh, the based on the spool bulb. And uh, the right one is a sub bulb. Uh, it also contains a spool bulb the inside, but it, it also has this feedback function inside. So it can adapt to the much higher responses. Okay. And uh, uh, next, I'm going to show you the power source. Please let me change the slide. Okay, can you see? Okay. Uh, next. Let me switch to the pneumatic power source. The power source is also important factor to move the pneumatic circuit. And uh, uh, this is the, the classification of the power source driven by electric power. It is composed of the positive displacement compressor and a turbo compressor. So positive displacement compressor means if the confined area of the volume is uh, pushed, all the volume of the air is compressed and that pressure itself is raised. So how to compress the air is divided into the two methods. One is a linear motion called reciprocating, and another is a rotary, which uses rotational motion. The turbo compressor means that the air energy is obtained by using the momentum. And uh, uh, it has uh, two kinds. One is using the centrifugal force and the other is using the axial force. Uh, let me briefly introduce one by one. Uh, this is the case of the compressor using the positive displacement one. And uh, as you see, uh, this is a uh, reciprocating where the cylinder itself is pushed and the air is compressed. And this is a gear type rotary uh, the compressor. And by rotating the gear, the each room is compressed. And uh, the big characteristic of this compressor is that it is easier to generate the higher pressure while the flow rate itself tends to be low. On the other type, on the other type, on the other case, uh, on the other hand, uh, if uh, the the turbo compressor is utilized, then the pressure tends to be lower because uh, it allows the leakage between the turbines and casing, but uh, it is less likely to be broken. So this type of the compressor tends to be utilized for the public equipment, such as a tap water or the compressor for the uh, in public spaces. And this is the uh, structure for the uh, utilizing the actual force. Okay, but uh, for designing the mobile robot or uh, the wearable device actuators, much more smaller type of the, uh, the pneumatic power source would be required. So how can you so take advantage of the much smaller type of the power source? So currently, 
uh, the many types of smaller pneumatic pump uh, pumps are merchandised. Uh, this is one of their uh, the uh, the products. It's a very handy size and very compact, and it can as a surprise zero point zero nine megapascal. It is driven by the very small electric motors, and uh, uh, the big difference from the previous type is that it utilizes that the diaphragms uh, instead of using the gears. So the friction tends to be smaller and the loss will be reduced. This is a big advantage. And the next one is uh, uh, much more the simpler structure. Uh, this is a gas bomb, uh, which was used for the jumping robot. Uh, it contains the CO2 gas. And inside of this gas, uh, inside of the bomb, it contains 12 grams CO2. But the total rate itself is 250 grams. The pressure is uh, uh, 6 megapascal which is uh, quite high. So to be utilized for the jumping, uh, this high pressure needs to be reduced almost one tenth. So this is a reason why that we use the regulator to reduce the pressure. But as you can imagine, only 12 CO2 gas is contained compared to that uh, total weight it's a very, uh, the small power density uh, for the total. So just the a couple of times jumping, uh, all of the energy is consumed. So uh, while we developing this kind of the robot, we are also investigating much more larger energy uh, uh, the contained power source with the portable size. This is one of the solution, dry ice. Dry ice itself is, as you know, the uh, very easy to be obtained. And from the solid to the gas, the, the volume itself uh, expands 750 times, quite large. So first, at the beginning, we try to utilize this dry ice by milling, or just to uh, use the heat energy from the outside. But, uh, it tends to, it tended to take a very longer time to obtain the uh, useful pressure. The horizontal axis shows the time after the dry ice is contained, while the vertical axis shows the pressure change. After it zero, reaches to the 0 0.4 megapascal, and then we try to use it for the jumping motion. One jumping motion, then the pressure decreased. And to be recovered, it requires 100, almost 100 seconds. And for the next second jumping behavior, uh, it requires 350 seconds, quite larger. So one solution is that uh, using uh, the tank might be uh, the useful, but for uh, mounting on the smaller size of the robot, the large tank is not a good idea. But we focused on the following phenomenon. Please look at the video. Inside the uh, case, 
the dry ice is contained. And as you see, it is the part of it is changes in the liquid, not the gas. And after that, the uh, valve is opened. And then the liquid changes into the solid. The reason why that we try to do this kind of the experiment is that after the inside of the uh, case reaches to the 0 0.4 megapascal, the pressure doesn't change. So we try to investigate what was happening in the inside. This is the answer. Uh, this is a phase transition uh, diaphragm. The horizontal axis shows the temperature, while the vertical axis shows the pressure. Uh, from the beginning, it follows to this line, uh, which is a line dividing between the solid and the gas. But if it reaches to the 0 0.52 megapascal, this is the absolute value of the pressure. So in the gauge value, it is 0 0.42 megapascal. Then at this condition, the solid, the part, part of the solid turned into the liquid. And then gradually the solid changes to the liquid. And after this point, after this statement, then it gradually uh, raises the uh, pressure again. Then it follows to this tendency. So just after this, we try to obtain the gas, the liquid energy, which means that if the, uh, the inside of uh, is connected to the cylinder, then part of the liquid changes into the gas, while the other parts changes into the solid. So the energy, solid to the energy, as a solid uh, changing to the solid, is uh, transmitted, transferred to the heat energy to make the liquid change the gas. Then, uh, as a former version, we try to so, collect the heat, but it took a long time. While if the heat energy is accumulated as a liquid phase, then you can immediately obtain the gas energy from the liquid to the gas. Then uh, using this uh, the dry ice power cell, uh, the robot can keep jumping for 12 times. Uh, so quite a uh, uh, longer uh, the time. And uh, uh, this is the, the vessel, uh, the 460 gram, uh, the, uh, the total, and inside of it, 430 gram dry ice is contained. And uh, this might be also utilized for the wearable device uh, application. And uh, this is uh, 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 the operation to uh, uh, prepare for the dry ice power cell. After the dry ice is set the inside of the vessel, uh, the valve is opened, and then the uh, one part of the automatic mobile can be lifted up by using the, uh, the air jack. And uh, this motion can be uh, repeated five times by using the 430 grams dryer. Okay. Uh, this is a, uh, just a brief uh, explanation for the dry eyes uh, and uh, as a power source. 
Okay, so let me change. Next slide. Sorry to be changing uh, uh, many times, but uh, okay. Okay, can you watch it? The last topic is the application to the soft pneumatic actuators. And uh, uh, if you are trying to use the very soft uh, the tubes, it is not enough to design the actuator or the robot for realizing you are desiring motion. Because if the uh, soft balloon is uh, so compressed by the air, it tends to extend, expand to the all the directions. So, to obtain your desiring motion, one part needs to be restricted for the ballooning. This is the one of the ways for obtaining your desiring motion. So uh, previously, there are a uh, couple of types of restraining the ballooning, uh, which can be classified for the ballooning direction. One is the thrust ballooning type, and the other is radial ballooning type. And for the ballooning method, they are also divided into two ways. One is utilizing the stretching motion of the material, and the other is using the opening motion of the bent part. And for example, in the ballooning for the thrust using the stretch of the material, the, the flexible microactuator uh, proposed by Professor Suzumori will be the very famous. And uh, the radial ballooning, uh, uh, the McBain actuator will be the very popular. And actually, for this actuator, the shrinking motion for the actual direction uh, is a very usefulness. On the other hand, for the opening motion, opening of the bend part, for the thrust ballooning is the uh, barrels will be the one of the examples. But the blank for this area has had not been proposed in previously. So uh, we try to uh, so, uh, propose the actuator fitting for this blank. Uh, okay, this is the very simple structure which we named the flat tube. The flat tube is the very as uh, a thin structure, uh, which means the it forms a flat, and if the inside is uh, pressurized by the air, it balloons and ap approaches to the circular form for the cross-section. 
this is the overview of the flat tube. And uh, if the inside is pressurized, it expands to this direction. But as you see, you cannot expect the large displacement just using this structure. So we try to expand, we try to design the amplification method of this displacement. Uh, this is the spiral structure using the flat tube. If the inside is pressurized, it expands to the actual direction. And we named it the WTA, the abbreviation of the one tube exit. And uh, uh, it tends to uh, uh, generate slightly large disparate measure, uh, ratio. And not only the linear motion, but if the one part is restricted, it also arises a curving motion as well. And besides, if the one part is restricted by the, uh, the uh, wires with a tilted direction, then it arises, it generates the screw motion just to be extended to the as a balloon. Uh, so this uh, device itself uh, can be designed by using the urethane material, which has the same plastic uh, elasticity. And uh, the fabrication process is as follows. The first, you can use the general type of the tube with the cylindrical shape. And uh, you can add the powder to protect the stick between two of them. Then uh, uh, the two ends are pressed by the plate and heat is added. And after that, uh, the, it is cooled down. If the plate itself is uh, released, then the shape can be maintained. This is a very easy process for the fabrication of the flat tube. And since there is not so uh, uh, the stretch for the material, therefore it can maintain the very large uh, the pressure. Uh, if the reserve point megapascal is applied, then uh, it can generate the eight watt, 80 watts with 80 grams. Okay, so let me skip this one. And uh, so how to apply uh, for the devices? So if you are trying to uh, assist the human body for the multiple joints, the curving actuator might be very uh, suitable. For example, uh, focusing on the finger joint, uh, it consists of the uh, two or uh, more than three joints. Then, so if the one part of the wound tube actuator is restricted, then it can generate the curving motion just like this. And for the one joint assisting motion, uh, just like the elbow, the following structure uh, would be the helpful which means that the, it consists of the two sets of the one the tube actuators. And it is connected by the wire. If the green part of the, uh, if the red part of the wire is expanded, then the joint is bent. While the, if the blue part is expanded, uh, 
the blue uh, the wire itself is pulled. And then uh, the joint itself is extended. Uh, this is the, uh, the elbow assist motion device. And uh, it is composed of the two WTAs pressurized by the pneumatic. The scenes, the structure itself has uh, the soft spring materials, spring-like materials. It has a very softness. And then uh, by adjusting the air uh, for the output part, then you can control the joint motor. Uh, if we visited the rehabilitation facility center, uh, some patients were annoyed uh, with uh, moving their uh, damage to so, uh, the, the, hand, uh, the, uh, the hand. In this case, in his case, that the right uh, the hand itself is paralyzed. Then to assist the movement, we try to utilize this, uh, uh, the actuator. And uh, here to be fit for the, uh, the hand, uh, the one tube actuator itself is uh, uh, so formed in the zigzag shape. And then uh, to be fit for the shape, uh, it can softly assist the motion. Uh, this is a case when the whole four actuators are uh, gathered together and uh, all the direction can be stretched. Okay. Next one is the application for the mobile robot. Uh, this is a case to uh, utilize for the uh, narrow area for the victims searching. And to do that, how to steer the direction is important. And uh, here, uh, to steer the direction, how to curb the rubbing uh, the one tube actuator itself for the whole direction is uh, important. Uh, the one part is uh, connected to the center, and the other part is connected to the eccentric part. And uh, by using this structure, if the inside is pressurized, it can curve to this direction, maintaining the uh, mm, uh, constant length of the wire. Then if the eccentric part is rotated so by the DC motors, uh, it is expected to curve to the arbitrary direction. Uh, here is a, uh, uh, the motion uh, controlled by the ROC submotor combined with the pneumatic energy. And uh, this is a part to uh, propel from the rear area. And this is another structure to generate the moving direction. And by combining the steering motion on the top and uh, the rear part, then uh, uh, it could uh, pass through the narrow area to supply the water for the victims. And not limited to the spiral form, but it can also form to the much more complicated structure as well. This is the initial condition of the flat tube. And if it is formed in the zigzag ways, 
uh, it can uh, curve to this form. And one part is connected by the fiber. Then combined with uh, using these two actuators, uh, it can curve to the left to right and right to left. So we are trying to uh, develop a kind of the uh, uh, preparing uh, wave motions inspired by the, uh, the garden ear. Uh, if you go to the aquarium, for example, uh, you might have been uh, watching this kind of the motion uh, in that area. And beneath the ground, uh, they tend to dig the hole with using the waves. And we observed, so how they dig the hole. Uh, on the half part of the body is uh, digged by the very high frequency movement, while the latter part of the body is trying to maintain the constant shape. Maybe it is aimed for reduce the consumed energy. And uh, following the, uh, the half part of the body, we are trying to imitate uh, their garden ear digging motion by using the, uh, the zigzag of the flat tubes. As you see, uh, it could uh, dig almost 80 centimeters. Uh, and uh, we are trying to steer the direction under the, under the earth to search the victims, uh, which was uh, the base due to the landslide or slow slide. Okay. Uh, next, I'm going to show you the sliding motion by using the flat tube. Actually, the flat tube has a many uh, are the very attractive motions. And uh, this is our original motion. And uh, uh, let me briefly show you so how it could behave. Uh, normally, uh, if the tube is bent, uh, it occurs a buckling point. Uh, this is a uh, uh, cross section. Uh, the, this is a, a cylindrical tube, and the inside here, the water is supplied. If the tube is bent, uh, the it occurs a cutting off, and then uh, the fluid can the flu, flow rate itself can be suspended, and the flow itself can be stopped. It's a kind of the valve. But even if the one part is pressurized, nothing happened by using this structure because the tube for the downstream side prohibits the movement from this condition. On the other hand, if you replace this tube with the flat tube, what happened? As you see, the buckling point could smoothly move along the tube. And then the downstream side of the tube can be thrown out. And this is a very peculiar characteristic to the flat tube. So we tried to uh, apply this movement for the actuator. Here, the flat tube is bent with the similar shape of the lambda. Then the ring is covered. We named it lambda 
drive. If the one side of the tube is pressurized from this condition, the link can slide smoothly along the downstream side of the tube. But just using this uh, structure is not maintaining the st stable condition because due to the friction between the ring and the tube, uh, it tends to be the uh, loss. So the ring is replaced with the slider composed of the free rollers and uh, the cover. And this cover itself is helpful to prevent the tube from slipping out. And uh, this cover is set to be passively swung. If one side is pressurized, the stopper is tilted automatically, and then it is expected to move. Okay, so uh, this motion uh, is expected to uh, apply for the rescue operation. So we designed the following device, which he names the fluid powered ropeway. Uh, this is uh, supposing the, that uh, the half collapse building. If the tube is strong first, and then uh, the gondola uh, carrying the camera and the microphone is expected to move along this tube. Uh, this is the uh, demonstration video using the fluid powered ropeway. And uh, this is a real time video. And even though the messy condition, if the tube is strong appropriately, then the gondola carrying the camera can be smoothly removed. Since the tube is set in the U turn uh, shape, uh, if the, the other side of the tube is pressurized, the gondola can return, and then the tube is collected. Okay. And uh, uh, you can also observe the very uh, interesting phenomenon. This is the flat tube, uh, which is uh, bent in the round shape. And in this case, uh, the water is pressurized. And uh, as I explained, the flat tube has a role for moving the, uh, the cutting off area. So by keeping the uh, motion repeatedly, uh, the periodic uh, the shaking motion can be arised. This is a basic phenomenon of this uh, flat ring tube. Uh, the, if the tube is bent and one side is pressurized, buckling point occurs, and that point is moved from the upstream to the downstream, and then uh, it returns to the initial condition. And uh, this also happens uh, not in the pipe, but the, only the flat tubes. It is peculiar to the flat tubes. And uh, uh, it shows uh, the uh, frequency tendon uh, the horizontal axis shows the flow rate and the vertical axis shows the ten frequency. If the uh, flow rate increases, the frequency monotonically increases. As you see that uh, if the free roller is uh, touched from the inside of the FRT, uh, it, the uh, rotational motion 
was arised. And uh, we tried to utilize for the mortar at the beginning. And uh, uh, it is very easy to be fabricated, but not limited to the mortar. We also tried to investigate for the massage device just like this. And uh, the students who fabricated this type is always trying to uh, touch, make it touch on their shoulders. So we try to investigate what was happening in the inside of the body. And it seems that uh, this is a, uh, uh, sorry, I missed it, but uh, uh, if the thermography is uh, uh, measured, and then the temperature was uh, raised a little bit, and then that raised temperature was maintained. So we are trying to so utilize it for the massage device for the pregnant woman or the pacemaker users. Okay, <clears throat> so time is coming. So I'm going to summarize the uh, class for this session. And uh, <clears throat> for uh, using the pneumatic devices, I showed you the differences between the incompressible fluid and the compressible fluid. And uh, so to take advantage of these characteristics of the compressible fluid, I showed you the pneumatic cir circuit components. Uh, referring to the jumping behavior and how to design the syringe itself was explained by using the phenomenon of the dynamic pressure change. And uh, I showed you the valve control method and the pneumatic power source. And finally, uh, I a little bit should uh, talk about the application of the soft pneumatic actuators. So that's all for uh, giving you your uh, information. But if you have any question, uh, please ask me. Thank you so much, Professor Tsukakoshi. It was very interesting presentation. So shall we give Professor Tsukakoshi an enthusiastic thumbs up? <laughs> thank you. Fraud. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor mm -hmm. Skokoshi. Yeah. Uh, okay. Any questions, everybody? Good. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.